Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien, and this is kind of a haul from, from Megacon down in Orlando, Florida. Plus, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about my adventures while there. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty cool adventure, uh, mostly because of all the cool people I met. Um, there's the badge. And on the back of the badge, I have a sticker given to me by Roscoe from YouTube. Only got to meet him for a few split seconds, but it was still very cool to be in his in his presence. Um, but hopefully, I hope to to hang out with him some more someday. Um, let's see. I got this T-shirt, and I got this T-shirt. This is going to be very disorganized and probably a longer video than I want it to be. But anyway, that's the way things are. Um, so I went down to MegaCon on a Wednesday, came back after the con was pretty much over. So it was five days of not sleeping very much and hanging out with lots of people. Um, big among them was Travis, a.k.a. Bueller, Comics with Bueller. He, uh, he gave me this comic. Um, someone gave it to him, I guess. It's a variant cover. So one thing I learned from going to Megacon is how big variant covers are. I just didn't really understand that because there are all these companies that do their own variant covers, and they were all over the con. Uh, Bird City Comics, Carnivore, those are just the two names I caught. Um, and uh, so I don't know if this was a con exclusive, but there were lots of con exclusives. Um, this is a very cool cover, but it is just stapled right over the comic. So I don't know if that means it just says exclusive variant cover by Pablo Villa Lobos, signed Lobos. Um, I went to several panels that were just about people who make their living from doing variant covers, nothing else. Um, one was, you know, a panel of people who were exclusive to just one comic book shop that does exclusive covers. It just kind of blew my mind. <laughs> I guess it makes sense in a way people go to the cons and they want to pick up something special. So you have a con exclusive variant cover. It's a way to do it. Um, there was one guy. Um, I can't remember his name now. It was someone that uh, Bueller interviewed in one of the panels. He does like 12 co covers a month. He does the pencils, and then he actually, he, he's someone living in, uh, oh, an Asian country now. I, I'm blanking. Um, uh, he, he does the pencils, and then he has a whole crew of people who, do, who color it for him, and then he does the final touch-up on the color. So um, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's just one example. But I was at another panel that was not uh, not hosted by Bueller, and uh, there was just five people who their entire jobs was to do uh, variant covers. And I guess Clayton Crane, there was a Clayton Crane panel. I think all he does is variant covers, but I could be wrong. Speaking of variant covers of a sort, here's another thing I picked up. They There was a whole table where they just had old comics, uh, probably, I assume, uh, in the public domain, that they had uh, commissioned modern artists to do covers for the comic. Maybe it'll look better outside of here. Um, uh, so the, the old, there's a reprint of the old comic inside and a new cover to go with it. And uh, actually the old, the original cover inside. They're both kind of cool. Maybe I like the original, but maybe just because it's old and nostalgic. And inside they really, at least in this case, really only reprinted one story from planet comics because i think these were like 64 page comics and this is very thin i don't know how many pages but i would guess 20 pages so um the story in here is nonsensical <laughs> to, the, to the extreme but oh there's more than one story but maybe they just removed the ads and put in some of the best stories uh i was i was a little disappointed that it wasn't like the whole comic inside here but kind of a fun concept again um in the variant cover mode in a weird in a different kind of way um variant covers from the past you might say and they charged me 15 dollars for this um and i at some point i got into kind of a con mode and i was like okay i'm gonna 
I'm going to give in and spend some money. There's another comic I got that was a um, a promotional uh, advanced copy, I thought, of Redcoat from the um, Ghost Machine line of comics. There was a Ghost Machine table. And I was like looking at it and I thought, oh, I'll get that. I asked him, you know, is this uh this in the stores yet and he said no this is the con exclusive and uh but then we said 20 bucks for the con exclusive and i i had a moment of hesitation and then i grabbed the con exclusive paid the 20 bucks read it in a few minutes later while waiting between panels and it was only 16 pages long and it said continued in issue number one of red coat so it was not an advanced con exclusive copy of it. It was a promotional thing to get you to read the comic that was 20 bucks. And I was really pissed. And I just gave it to someone else who I thought might like it better than me. Uh, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> let's see. What else have I got? Okay. So one of the cool guys who was part of the Florida crew that was there was Steve Whiting. And I was hanging out with some of the florida crew as i think of them at a uh at a at one of the vendors just selling back issues of comics and i picked out some of the more expensive mostly i bought really cheap comics but some of the more expensive comics uh from the herb trimp era of the hulk maybe herb trimp and marie severin um so i got hulk 109 hulk 110 Hulk 111. This one, I, I am excited. It was cheaper, but it, I love it because it's got a subscription crease. I love the subscription creases because I had subscriptions as a kid. So that's not how you call it. Some of these covers are really great. Hulk 112. I'm using the FaceTime camera on my fairly new laptop. And it's a lot better than the old FaceTimes, but it doesn't seem to want to focus on the comics that well. Hulk 114. 118. I particularly like to get things, I'm collecting the old whole Bronze Age Submariner run and I like to get things with uh, the Submariner on the cover too. And Hulk 120. Kill him, kill the Hulk. Yeah, that's gonna work out well for you army people. Um, so I went to pay for these and before I knew it, Steve Whiting had already paid for a, a good chunk of those. So basically all of these Hulks, all of these fantastic Hulks were a gift from Steve Whiting. Thanks so much, Steve. So, uh, sort of inspired by Steve when, uh, when Sean Puff 83 comics, uh, went to buy his comics. I pay. I jumped in and I paid for his comics from. I think it was the same vendor. Um, so I hope Puff was okay with that. Uh, me uh, swooping in like that, but I I wanted to to uh, to do the same thing Steve had done. It was great meeting Puff. Uh, we had some shenanigans where I kept missing meeting him, and finally we got to hang out together on Sunday. And I got to meet his brother Jace, and that was really cool. He's a comic book collector too, but I think he's I think he's more into video games. Um, and like I said, Steve Whiting was really cool. Got to hang out with Raul Hylia, comic bro, fantastic guy. He and a fellow named Richard, also T, also known as T Boner, <laughs> trombone player. Uh, they taught us how to play dominoes and a Spanish dice game. And uh, uh, hanging out with those guys was a real highlight. Uh, Bronze Age Brian, who I have <laughs> for a long time been thinking of as Bronze Age Byron. Uh, my dyslexia kicked in on his name. And um, so I apologize, Brian, if I called you Byron <laughs> at some point during the con. Um, and uh, Un Unruly Simeon, it was great chatting with him, hearing about his life of endless uh, traveling around. And uh, and uh, Jeff, uh, Cantonese comic kid, I had a great conversation with him about Vampirilla and the publishing history and the Frazettas and all of that. That was really cool. I'll uh, stick in some photos of him. There were there was this cosplayer who was always in a different costume, and then 
people would po pose with her to take selfies and Jeff kept going back for those. Um, so I think there's some cool pictures of him with her that he let me have that I'll put up here. I may also steal pic other pictures from people's Instagrams because I didn't do a good job of doing the selfies with people like everyone else was doing. Um, maybe I'll intersperse some other photos and pictures, but the bad, bad photography definitely comes from me. I didn't put enough effort into that. Um, let's see. Also, uh, was there anyone else I missed in that group? There was a guy named Pete who was really cool, who is not on YouTube, but he's on Instagram. I think his name is evil comic collector Pete. He had the coolest tattoos on his arms. Um, a, a real pop art gallery there, uh, including a, a fantastic swamp thing right on his hand and right above was Howard the Duck looking like he was drawn by Val Mayrick in the original appearance of Howard the Duck. Um, and like I said, I got to meet Roscoe. Mastodon was there. I didn't really get to talk with Don a whole lot, but um, it was cool just meeting him uh, there. And then there was the whole Robbie crew. Um, Robbie, so it was almost like we were a bunch of schools of, little schools of fish that sometimes came together to become a bigger school of fish and then we would break apart again. So like, a lot of times my little school of fish was John Spilios, Spiliotopoulos. I don't know. I can't, John, I've got to get betrayed by you how to say your name and his wife, Brittany and Travis and me, we were one little school that would sometimes join the larger school. And of course there was other mixing and matching of things. Um, and then Robbie had his crew and there was, there was Robbie who, is even more amazing in uh, person than I could have imagined from his videos, which are already, you know, amongst the best on YouTube by far. And his friend, Kevin, who is the artist on his upcoming comic book. That It's really, I think, Kevin's comic book with Robbie in the mix, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, Cause I think they're co-writing it and then Kevin is drawing it. And, uh, and Kevin showed me some of his art and it's amazing. Um, so I really hope that project, you know, shoots into the stratosphere when they get it on Kickstarter. And then, uh, Mike was a really cool guy who, um, I think he works in the shop in Robbie's shop and they're friends. And he, he and I had a fun conversation about wildlife, dangerous wildlife, um, out in the woods and such. And also their friend Luther, who's also a comic book artist. And he showed me some really cool art. So I can't wait for him to finish his project. Um, uh, he's writing and drawing his own comic, which he said won't be out for quite a while, but eventually be out. Did I forget anybody of the people we hung out with? Um, we, I saw, I met very briefly also comics by the bay, um, and, uh, fire guy, Ryan, we kept bumping into him and, um, he seems like a really cool guy. So I hope someday to sit down and have dinner with him or something. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, oh, wait, did I do something? Uh, <laughs> so let's get back. I, I got a bunch of, uh, I got some Marvel 2 and ones This one with Sarah Submariner on the cover cost me a little bit uh, because they put it in Mylar, I guess. Uh, but it's got, it's a number, number two, so I guess it was okay to spend a little more money on it. And then very cheaply from a two for the price of one place, I got this one, uh, number 23, with Thor and the Thing. And at the same place, I believe, I got this Spider-Man and Frankenstein's monster. I think this ended up being a double that I didn't realize I already had. Or maybe it was this one, the Human Torch and Thor from Marvel Team Up, number 26. And um, Master of Kung Fu, number 44. This has um, Paul Glacy art on the inside. And this one, this one turns out, it looks almost like Paul Galassi art on the cover, but it's actually Johnny Craig. So this one has Johnny Craig art on the inside too. All of those were two for the price of one. And so this is kind of silly. There was this comic. I don't see the adventures of the fly very often. I've been given one issue by Higgy Pop and I really loved it. So he turned me on to the adventures of the fly. So now I was wanting to get more and it's this really beat up, whoa, copy of it but it was in the bins of the two for one stuff. And that sort of led me to say, well, I might as well, 
I need at least one more comic to go with this. And then I bought a few more of those, two for one. And from, so John Spilios, who's a great guy, he's he's like, uh, I really got to know John and his wife, Brittany, uh, during this visit, and that was fantastic. He's someone, uh, doesn't have a channel, but he comments a lot on people's videos. You see him in live chats on, on Robbie's uh, live shows and others. And he's a great friend of Comics with Bueller. And anyway, I had a fantastic time getting to know John. He works at a comic book shop. And another branch of his comic book shop had a booth at the um, at, at the uh, con and had one of the best uh, selections, at least for me. And, you know, prices that said, yes, you can go ahead and buy this without stopping to think about it. You know, priced right. So I got this Lois Lane there. I believe I got this Superman there. I, I might be wrong. I might have gotten this one somewhere else because it's in Mylar. I'm not sure if they used Mylar at that. Famous Funnies, I think it was called. Um, and I think I got this uh, Worlds Unknown there. Um, this Worlds Unknown is uh, adapts original science fiction stories. So uh, they adapt the story based on that the day the Earth stood still was based on. It's not called the day the Earth stood still. I forget what it's called. I think it's by Harry Bates is the writer's name. Anyway, Rich Buckler cover. Looking forward to reading that. And then I filled in a lot of on my ongoing hunting of runs for uh, the, the DC mystery comics from the Bronze Age. Secrets of the Haunted House. <laughs> that one's so goofy, the expression on these women's faces, like out of a commercial or something. And then I love this cover, uh, Secrets of the Haunted House number 20. Who did this cover? Joe Orlando, the great Joe Orlando who by this time I think was more of an editor than an artist, but he started as an artist at EC, I believe. Secrets of the Haunted House number 29. That looks like a Kaluta cover to me. Is it signed? I don't see a signature. It looks like Joe Kaluta. Uh, wait, what was Kaluta's first name? Wait, I thumbed myself down? What are you talking about here? Um, Secrets of the Haunted House number 32. That looks like a buckler cover to me also. I don't see a signature. Um, I'm obsessed by figuring out the cover artists in the Bronze Age. Uh, no sign signature here either that I can see. Secrets of the Haunted House number 39. Looks like Dracula. And apparently there's a Mr. E story in here. Weird mystery tales. This one's kind of disturbing to me. Um, I should know what, what art. This is one of those classic uh, DC cover artists, and I can't quite recall. Um, I should know who that is. Uh, Witching Hour. This one has someone's signature on it, but um, Witching Hour number 45. This is signed by Nick Cardi. There we go. Very cool cover. Um Witching Hour number 67. This is a wedding cover, so it immediately made me think of my friend Naman, uh, the comic book worm who collects wedding covers. And one of that Lois Lane cover that I showed earlier was a wedding cover. This is a really cool unexpected cover from the, I guess it's a Silver Age uh, unexpected. Love that cover. Number 111. Um, by Nick Cardi also. Nick Cardi's a great artist. And unexpected number 128. Uh, I feel like I should recognize this artist too, but I don't see a signature. Um, that's a cool cover, but it's very silly. The guy got lost in a mirror, but his shoe remains behind. And apparently he didn't wear socks. Unexpected 151 with an exploding volcano. Would that be Nick Cardi also? I know there's a, can't remember his name now, someone with a Spanish name who, uh, who someone on YouTube did a whole live video about all about him. And then I was, I have trouble finding Monsters Unleashed. I have one or two Monsters Unleashed to go. This is an early Boris Vallejo cover. Probably pronouncing that wrong. 
He just wrote Boris on the cover, of course, not Boris Vallejo. And this has some nice, um, a Val Mayrick Frankenstein story in it, and some reprints and a few other short stories. And then I got a issue of Foom that I didn't already have. And this is very cool because I've been, I've been collecting some old Marvel John Carter art, original art, and picking up more issues of it. And so this issue is dedicated to their, uh, their Edgar Rice Burroughs line of uh, comics that they've been doing at this time when they got the rights. So, uh, oh, there's some Red Sonia's early cosplay. So there's an article all about Edgar Rice Burroughs by um, Sam Moskowitz, who's kind of a science fiction historian. There's an old uh, Tarzan illustration. And um, a Marv Wolfman interview about John Carter, Warlord of Mars. Here's an old Sunday strip of John Carter. I didn't know that it was a Sunday strip, but I guess that makes sense. Um, and this I really like. These are layouts by Gil Kane, his preliminary artwork as he plans out uh, many pages of John Carter of Mars. I love seeing that. I don't know why, but I love preliminary artwork. And then here's a sample, an unpublished sample spread of John Carter as illustrated by a renowned fantasy artist, Alex Nino. Now, I worry, did they, like, were they going to give this to Alex Nino and then instead they chose Gil Kane? Or what happened? I would have loved, did Alex Nino do any issues of John Carter? I don't recall that. Then we've got Roy Thomas on Tarzan. So anyway, I thought this was an exciting issue to have. <clears throat> and back then, this would, when I got Foom as a kid, would have been the only place I would even see previews for any comics upcoming. Uh, so anyway, I was really happy to get that. So let's see, there's a few other things. How much time have I taken up so far? Uh, not too bad for me. <laughs> so, um... I stopped by Charles Soule's booth on the last day when things were less busy. And I just wanted to tell him how much I enjoyed his novel, The Oracle Year. Because um, he's also a novelist on top of everything else Charles Soule does. And I kind of got, <laughs> I kind of, then they said, oh, well, you should get these two other books that he just had out. So, you know, I probably would have eventually bought these, but cheaper. But I'm giving the money directly to the author, so I was glad to do that. Um, this is quite a cool cover for his novel, Anyone, which I think the basic plot is someone someone finds a way where you can live other people's lives briefly or something like that. So um, he signed both these books for me. For Damien, You Can Be Anyone, and then this not very readable signature, Charles Soule, and also his novel, Endless Voyage, which I think is his more recent one. And he said he was working on another one. So he somehow finds time for all this. For Damien, enjoy the journey. CHD. <laughs> See, Charles D. Soul? Apparently. I don't know. Um, it doesn't say Charles D. Soul in the uh on the when they write the author's name. So what else do I have? So I discovered um, Jeff Isherwood, it, it, there was a huge artist alley, right? Uh, kind of uh, artist you that went around most of the convention, most of the convention floor, most of the exhibitors floor. So I ran into Jeff Isherwood and I started talking to him and looking through his original art. For me, he his big, the most meaningful thing of Jeff Isherwood is that he had a spent a significant amount of time on Conan and I think also some King Call in the uh, late eighties. I think it was the late 80s. Anyway, I was looking through his original art and I thought I would buy one if there were some Conan pages or some sword and sorcery pages there, but there weren't. So I commissioned him for a sketch. And uh, technically it was a single figure sketch, but this is what he ended up giving me. It took him 
uh, overnight, I guess. Um, so I commissioned the sketch on Thursday and I got it on Friday. Um, so he said, well, what's Conan without the background? So he put in a tower and another building and he said, and of course, Conan's been busy killing people. So I need to show the dead people. So he put in all this, uh, extra detail. Um, so I was very pleased with that. Um, I, I have to say in terms of collecting original art, I've noticed if you look at sales on heritage, these con sketches, you have to get them because you love them. They're not investments the way, uh, the a way, the way a good comic book page might be. I don't think they gain a lot of value over time compared to the, you know, the stuff that was actually published. Um, but I am really glad to have it. Uh, I just wanted to say that for anyone thinking that, uh, I feel like a kid, somewhere I saw someone, you know, thinking they were investing in original art by buying sketches. But I don't think the sketches are the way to go if you're in term, if you're interested in monetary value of things going up over time. Uh, so I also talked. Speaking of buying art, I talked to Martin Simmons, who is the artist on the recent Universal Dracula and on the Department of Truth. And I saw him at a panel that that uh, Travis was uh, the moderator and he seemed really cool. So then I saw there was no one at his booth and I went and we had a nice chat for a while before I had to catch up to my friends. Um, and I will probably buy some of his art, but I decided not to get it there because I didn't, I was worried I would end up destroying it, carrying it home with me. I was lucky I found a way to make, keep this sketch intact in my bag. But um but yeah, he seemed like a really cool guy. And, you know, he talked a lot about how he's a comic book fan first. And like a lot of us comic fans, he he just diddled about with drawing here and there. And then at one some point he got really serious about it. And now his career is kind of taking off. Um, and, and interestingly also, his career is taking off once he stopped doing digital and he went to literally paint, painting his pages. So that's really cool. Um, I also taught, well, I went to Todd Grummet's table and ended up talking with Todd Grummet's wife. And that was actually kind of fun because she's known him since elementary school. And, uh, so I don't know if I'll buy Todd Grummet art or not, but I might at some point, um, there actually were some pretty impressive pages there, but he was busy talking to someone else who was doing a commission for, uh, but his wife was very cool. And then I, uh, talked with Alex. Savick? I'm not sure how to say his name. A well-known Spider-Man artist who I didn't know. He took over for John Romita on doing the Sunday comic book pages. And he also inked Larry Lieber, who was doing the daily comic book, the daily comic strip in the newspapers. And so I had a cool conversation with him about that. He said that in a lot of ways, he pretty much drew right over Larry Lieber's work. I mean, this is Larry Lieber later in life. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and that Stan Lee was writing the scripts and then he had Roy Thomas take over, but then he would, um, then Stan would kind of touch up the scripts. But after a while, Roy said, well, Stan is pretty much completely rewriting my scripts. So why don't we just have Stan take it back over? But all, all along it was saying Stan Lee and Larry Lieber in, in the credits. Um, but so Savick was, was inking Lieber. And then on the Sunday pages, uh, was Savick with Joe Sinna inking the pages. And those are, those were some beautiful pages. I really wanted to buy one, but then he told me what the price was and it was like, whoa. Um, but he did give me his email that I could buy some pages from him. So I might still do that. I also saw a really really, really cool Hawkman uh, splash page. Uh, that was very tempting. Oh, and we talked about um, um, Will Eisner a little bit because Savick had worked with Eisner and he talked about the process and how Eisner would send him these pencil, really pen rough pencil breakdowns and he would sort of finish them up and then Eisner would draw over them mostly with ink. Um, so 
uh, he did not think of himself as the penciler on that on that project. It was in the Escapist, I think. The Escapist meets the spirit or something like that. Um, and then I said, well, maybe you guys co-penciled it together. And he said, yeah, maybe that's it. Um, and then he said that Eisner and he were going to do some more projects together. Eisner was, you know, very happy with the result between the two of them. And then Eisner got sick. And that was that was the end of, of uh, Will Eisner's creative period. I don't know how long he was sick before he died. Um, but maybe. Anyway, so we could have seen more Eisner and Savick stuff. And I'll show a page here. I think it was for Overstreet. The Overstreet Guide at some point had four different artists who had done work with Eisner. Uh, they gave them a sketch that Eisner had made, and each one did a finished drawing based on the sketch. So uh, that was in Savick's portfolio also. And if you've followed me long enough, you know I'm, I'm a huge fan of Will Eisner's work, especially the spirit. Um, and one other artist, I ended up talking to a young guy um, I thought had really intense kind of horror images, almost like something you might see on a tarot card or something. I don't know. I don't know enough about tarot cards. I might be wrong, but he had done, he'd done some card work for some companies and, um, let's see, his name should be on the back of here. Uh, Matthew G. Lewis. And, uh, I really liked his paintings. I guess he does these mostly digitally. Um, I was suggesting he, he do physical paintings because I think he could sell his artwork. So these are some postcards he gave me for free for buying, for being the first person to print, buy a print. Um, so I bought this print, which I thought was really cool, which was inspired by Picasso's Guernicea. Um, cause, uh, this artist, uh, what's his name? Uh, Matthew had lived in Spain for a while. And so he had art that was inspired by Goya's black period, I think it's called, or dark period, and by some big pa uh, Pablo Picasso pieces that he saw in Spain. So uh, anyway, I think this is really cool. So hopefully I'll remember to follow this guy on Instagram. Is he on Instagram? I must have a, yeah, he's on Instagram, at Lost Keep. So that's a fun thing, meeting artists who are young, but um, incredibly talented like that. I don't know if he'll get into comics at all. I would think it would be really cool if there were variant covers with this kind of look, but I'm not sure if that would appeal to the variant cover collectors. <clears throat> so uh, we went out drinking a number of nights, uh, drinking way more than I should have. And on one night, uh some of us went on this ride that was just out on the street <laughs> in on the strip in Orlando uh, on the International Avenue where where the uh where all the hotels we were staying at were and uh so I'll include a little clip here first have you done this yeah. well done. You, really? Really yeah, okay. I mean it's nowhere near as bad as it looks it's safe right no, it's not. Everything's no, it's been not. Tested. It's very yeah. dangerous. They wouldn't yes. do this if it wasn't safe. Right. Right. Oh, Crowdfunding. Yeah. You want to wait? You want to wait till next year? We can crowdfund this. <laughs> <laughs> We're YouTubers. Oh, great. Yeah, he'll ask you at the end of it. He's talking shit about me right what's now. Size, what size shirt do you want? Double X. <laughs> we get, yeah, we get. Yeah, I told him to give you a small one. Start laughing. At it, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. I Double small. It. Double small. Oh my god. And gosh. tie it up to the side and everything. I think I did it one time. Yes. Wait, wait. Are you ready? <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> We're just gonna be the last people to do it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> What percentage of people pass out? Okay. Why don't you ask her the okay. why don't you ask her the question you want to ask her? How many people have died on this? That's ride? the one. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. That wasn't the okay. denial. <laughs> I don't think we denial. would be open right now. That's that's good. That's good. <laughs> How much will his heirs Robin? get if he dies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need my next of kin as well? 
It's Debbie Lamb. No, it's Robbie. Robbie. It's all at the bar. Are you are you recording or are you just ready? Okay. I'm recording right now. You're I've been recording, recording these. Elena, Jamie, I love you so much. <laughs> hey everybody. I talked him into it. He's gonna do it. Look, he's excited. I've been waiting to do this for a year. I'm not Will, scared will at you all. try not to kill Robbie? Yeah, this will be great. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, Robbie, if something does happen, yes. can I have your combo yeah. books? <laughs> no, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. We, you you heard already, that. We've already had a couple of beers, about four or five shots. <laughs> but I was okay with a this. Lot of the very <laughs> a lot of slippery nipples. A lot of slippery nipples. This is like a slippery nipple like ride here. Yeah, I just want to say one more thing. I love you, Mom. I want to say one more thing. Uh, All right, station. Yes. <laughs> this music sounds a little tragic. <laughs> How are you guys doing? No, we're doing good. We're, we're doing really good. I think yeah. we're a lot better than you guys. <laughs> if, if they die, this is half of comic book YouTube gone. <laughs> Did I hear Robbie say it was amazing? Oh, yeah. Maybe we should do it. Oh, no. God, Damien. Yes! Can we do it again? <laughs> Holy shit! You liked it. Pop, pop, boom, motherfucker. This was awful. <laughs> that was better than sleeping, man. What the fuck? Was that better than sex? That was, no. But it was awesome. That better than a lot yes. of things. Bruh. Dude, why have you only done that once? <laughs> Robbie and Bueller went up in the ride and... When Robbie said he loved it, I decided to do it. So John and I were going to do it. Our brother bonded. We're going to bond his brothers on this ride. And then John is so tall and so macho that their harness could not um, completely close on him. And he kept trying to shrink down to get it. So they do not make this, this ride uh, viable for people who are 6'5 or so. They should have just, or 6'6". Six, six, they should have just told him that he was too big beforehand because they probably knew it wasn't going to work. So then Robbie, who had loved the ride, jumped on and he and I shot up in space. I should have done it again before going because that ride was really cool. Um, so uh, I'll throw in some various clips of that. I feel like there's something I've forgotten. But anyway, thanks if you have for hanging in, in there all the way with me. Uh, thanks to all the people I met. If I forgotten to mention a few people i'm really sorry about that um it was it was pretty amazing pretty exhausting i i suspect i will go again so talk to y'all later bye bye